All right, welcome back everybody. This is week 11. We are gonna talk about MIDI today. Uh, as, uh, to be more specific, we're gonna talk about getting MIDI data from a controller into Super Collider where you will be able to use it to do any number of things, sort of whatever you can imagine. You can use, you know, you can use one of these keyboards here to play music. You can also use, I mean, this is just data, so you can use it to control a graphical interface or, you know, switch between sample banks. There's many, many things you can do. So I have a little bit of code prepared today. We are gonna boot the server and I have two synth thefts. Uh, I've tried to keep them both pretty simple. This one uh, plays a sample uh, there's almost nothing in this synth that it just plays a sample with uh, an amplitude argument. This one plays a sawtooth wave that goes through a low pass filter scaled by uh, a percussive sort of two segment envelope and an amplitude argument. So um, nothing too fancy. Uh, and before we get to MIDI, I do want to load a couple of samples in so we can play around with them. I'm hoping this lecture to show you how to create a simple uh, MIDI synthesizer and a, a, to map samples to a MIDI controller as well. So a little, little bit of column A, a little column B. Uh, I'm going to start by creating an empty event called B. And uh, in, let's see, I've, ahead of time I've, in my lecture code files, I have this little folder of silly drum samples and it's in the same location as this, this file. So uh, I think, let's see, if we, if we say um, a path name, uh, drum samples dot resolve relative. Let's see what should, uh, that looks correct to me. So if we say entries, that gives us an array of path names representing all of the samples in. There's our wood block, our clothes, hi-hat, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we're going to iterate over this and just load each one into the buffer, uh, uh, like so. So we collect, we are going to pass each path name in. And uh, just for starters, let's just post what we get. So this, um, it's this black code up here. We see path name, path name, path name, path name. So it's just posting each entire path name. Uh, there's a very convenient method called file name without extension. And this just gives us the file names. That's great. This is what I want to, yeah, take notes on that. Right? <laughs> uh, I, I just found this one because I was, I was looking at just file name. And I was like, mm, I don't want those waves there. And I was about to do some string manipulation. But then I just went to the help file and, and found this one. So that was, that was nice. So these are, these are um, if we check the class of each of these things that we're posting, we can see they're strings. Uh, this might work with an event, but I think the more traditional traditional, a typical thing to do is um, to use symbols. So we can just convert a string to a symbol and now we've got symbols. So each one of these, each one of these uh, names here is a symbol. So it's like a block, CHH, -H, et cetera, this kind of thing. So that's good. What we're gonna do is say B uh, at this symbol, right? So B, we have this empty event B, we're gonna say as we iterate over these path names, we're gonna uh, create a new um, symbol index in this event. And at that index, we're gonna store uh, a new buffer. And so we're gonna read this buffer. What we need is the full file path to this folder. And we already have a path name. Uh, and so uh, what we wanna do is say path.full Path. This is another path name method. And uh, I'll show you this actually. We'll, we'll comment this out just for a second and we'll say path.fullpath.postln. And so what we get here is uh, we can't see the, the quotes, but this is the, the full path to the block file, full path to the closed hi hat file. So this, these are all strings. So this is exactly what we want, as we've seen many times before. So this uh, loads all these buffers. So now if we say b.keys, we see it's, um, these are the symbols in our event b. So we can say b.tom2, that's a buffer, not play. We got that, uh, kick. 
right? So it's all in there. Um, so we got our buffers, we got our synth defs. Let's talk MIDI. The very first thing uh, that we want to do, well, really, the first thing you want to do is um, make sure your MIDI controller is connected to your computer before you launch Super Collider. I think you can, I'm not actually sure. I don't really test this very regularly. Maybe different versions of Super Collider behave differently, but it's always good to have things plugged into your computer before you open software which attempts to use them. So I already have this connected to my computer. Uh, so, you know, MIDI's coming into my computer, but it's not coming into Super Collider just yet. And you can um, uh, inform Super Collider that you'd like it to connect with available MIDI devices by saying MIDI in dot connect all. And um, that, should, uh, that should post something here. It could be that um, I already connected to MIDI devices before I started this recording. Uh, but let's say MIDI funk dot trace true. This is a second step, which is basically your generic show me every piece of MIDI data coming in. So trace is, is sort of a word that just means like, you know, just, it's like, it's like post LN. It's like, just show me everything. So we'll run this and I'm just going to hit some keys here. And this is a good sign. It just shows us that we're getting data in. So all of these notes, we're getting a bunch of uh, note on, note off messages. If I spin one of these knobs here, we're getting a control change message, these faders also. So everything is alive and well. And you can, you can keep this on as long as you like, but if you don't want to see data, you can just false this and, and run it again. And then, um, you know, no more. MIDI still coming in. And just, just, to, just to reiterate, this, when you run this MIDI in .connect all, you should see the post window say, here's what I have here, are your MIDI sources, here are your MIDI destinations. Um, but once you've connected MIDI devices, this doesn't really do anything a second time. So these, these two lines are very useful. This one to connect devices, this one to confirm the types of data coming in. So we should be good. And so now I'll introduce the, the primary object that I like to use for um, defining some action to be performed in response to incoming MIDI data. And that class is MIDI def. So the way we create a MIDI def is not with new. I think this is technically possible, but uh, the creation method uh, we use is based on the type of message that we'd like to respond to. So there are a couple of options. Uh, I don't want to do that. Let's put that there. Yeah, here's, so if we scroll down just a little bit, we see there's midi-def.cc. This is a responder which will only listen for control change messages like knobs and faders. This will only listen to note on messages, note off messages. So why don't we start by making a uh, note on MIDI def. And there are really just two things you need to provide a MIDI def with. One is uh, a, a symbol which represents a unique name, much in the same way that we give synth defs unique names. So you can, you know, call it whatever you want. We'll just say uh, note. So that's the, that's the name of this MIDI def. And then we also need to provide a function. So we do a set of curly braces. And this is a func this function will be evaluated whenever a note on message is received. So we can just do um, something very silly, like just post a string. So with this MIDI def is, is, exists, it's active, uh, MIDI devices are connected. And so every time I press a note, we should see hello in the post window. Hello, hello. We still have this trace on. Let's turn that off. Clear the post window. Give ourselves more room. That's all there is to it. You press a note, you get hello. Uh, almost always, we want to uh, MIDI data to do something which is dependent on the data that comes in. When we press middle C, we want to hear a certain pitch. When we press C sharp, we want to hear a different pitch. So. This one's not so good because it just does the same thing every time. I mean, we, we could do something. Let's, let's go one step further and we'll say, let's make a, a sawtooth wave. Um, let me just make sure I remember how this is working. I mean, just make sure it works, I guess. So freak, I don't know, 200. Yeah. Great. 
So we can say the default sounds like this. So if we just run this, then every note will make that exact sound. Okay, working, but how do we get the data into this function? We declare arguments. And there's, in the context of MIDI def, there's either going to be three or four arguments, depending on the type of message. And this is, this is because some uh, channel voice messages include uh, uh, two, two values. Like, for example, note on messages, there's two pieces of data that's carried. There's the note number and the velocity. Yeah, control change messages have a controller number and a controller value. But something like a program change message, that only has the program number attached to it. So um, in the case of note on, note off, and control change, we want four arguments. And you can name them whatever you want, but they will be always interpreted in the same order. So the first one is the value or velocity or just the, that one. Then we have the number, which is going to be either the note number or the controller number, uh, the channel, the MIDI channel on which the message is carried, and uh, the something called the source ID, which is like a unique identifier for a particular physical device. And we'll comment out the saw for a second, and I'm just going to post all of these. So this is like I'm making my own MIDI funk trace true here. I'm just this MIDI doesn't make any sound. It's just going to show us exactly what comes in. So I'm holding down this C. I thought it was middle C, but I guess I have the octave transposed down because it's note number 48, velocity 67, channel 0, which we humans refer to as channel 1, and then we have this complicated uh, source ID. So I'll press the B below it, 47, 46, 45, right? Try to get a high velocity. So we can really mash the keys, we get 127, and very quiet, we can get really low velocities. So this isn't changing, this isn't changing. So these, these really aren't going to be too useful for us. Maybe there's a situation where you want the channel or source ID. You really only need the source ID if you have two identical messages coming from different devices and you want to distinguish between them. So we don't really need that. We're not really interested in channel at the moment. So we don't even really have to define these. Um, we can just you know, only declare the ones that we want. And now we just have velocity and no number. <coughs> So then uh, to make sound with these pieces of data, well, I've given myself uh, a frequency argument and an amplitude argument. And these are the most, this is sort of the simplest way to map the data in a way that makes musical sense and kind of generally follows what we expect. So <clears throat> let's do, uh, so the frequency is going to be num.midi-cps. Easy, right? Because if we have 60 MIDI CPS, that gives us the frequency for middle C, 61, 62. So no need to do the math ourselves. We have a method. Um, and amp is going to be, well, the velocity is 0 to 127. So we don't want to plug those in as is, right? Because an amplitude of 127 is going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. One is our limit here. So how do we, how do we get that? This is what kind of. Divide by 127, right. Right, this is, this is good. We might even go a step further because if we play two notes at the same time with maximum velocity, then we're going to have two synths that, are, that have like peak amplitude. And so those are probably going to sum and distort. So uh, we might, you know, uh, divide this by two or something, right? So that maximum is like 0.5 or even 0.25. You can also do, if you, if the, if you prefer, you can say val dot lin lin or lin exp or something. You know, so there's many ways to do it. Zero, 127, we want to, like, if you want to think in terms of decibels, we can say the quietest one will be like minus 40 and the maximum will be minus 6 dot db, db amp. Yeah, I'll space this out. So you have different ways to do it. So this takes our initial value, which is this range, maps it onto this range, and then treats it as decibels, makes it amplitude. Yeah, so it's working. We can do our octave buttons. This has a fixed cutoff frequency in the low-pass filter of 1500, so really high notes are going to be pretty aggressively filtered, but low notes will, most of that spectrum will pass through the filter. We'll mess around with this later, I think, but 
that's um that's sort of the idea. Uh, I was on the fence about uh, including um, uh, note offs in this lecture. The main reason I, I'm leaning towards not doing it is because I've done it many times in the past. Tutorial nine is a good place uh, to go, and basically the MIDI lecture for any previous fall class. Uh, I think I also do the same things. It's like a very good chance you'll see that. So I'll just give you the the gist of it. Um, the you know we can't just uh, you know, basically, we need to keep track of all of the synths that currently exist. We, the first step would be we, we change this envelope to be something that sustains uh, with a, you know, an envelope with a gate, like an ADSR. And it, the note on would create the synth and set the gate to one. And it's going to expect a corresponding note off message to release that envelope. So this kind of approach would just not work because we're, we're just making a synth, not storing it anywhere, not giving it a name. And so there's no way to address it later. So we, we need to actually store this in a variable. But we can't just say like x equals synth because, uh, and then have the note on say x dot set. Because the problem is if we play a note, hold it down, x is that synth. Then if we continue holding that and press another note, then we make another synth called x. And, and, it, and that language side reference overwrites the first one. And so then when we release that second note, that'll fade out. But then the first one is a stuck note because we, we can't talk to it anymore. So the approach I use is we create an array uh, of size 128, right? Uh, so this just gives us a, an array of size 128, and it's, all, it's empty, but it has 128 spots. And each synth gets stored at the node number, right? Because you can't press down a key and then press it down again without releasing it first. So this gives every node its own private cubby in which it can live. And so then the node off. MIDI def will say notes at num dot set gate zero. And this is, uh, that's a pretty good starting point for a polyphonic synthesizer where you can arbitrarily sustain notes. So that's, um, we'll copy this and just, you know, go back to our, our first version just so it's in, in the notes here. But that's the, uh, that's the idea if you want to do polyphony. Uh, okay, so let's, let's get um, one of these to do something, right? And I, that's why I put a filter in the synth def, because right now it is fixed at 1500, but I'd like to be able to control that with a knob. Uh, and in, I'm, I'm switching tack here. I, I used to do this by creating a language side variable like CF uh, and just storing the value of the knob in here. But there's a better way, I think, is that, and that is to write the value directly to a control bus on the server and then have synths read from that bus. So we'll, we'll do it that way. If you want to see the language side variable version, again, you can look at previous videos. But uh, I think this way is slightly better for a couple of different reasons. <clears throat> so let's make, uh, first things first, a bus. Uh, see, so cutoff frequency bus is bus.control. One channel. Here we go. Okay. And now we're going to make a MIDI def that responds to control messages because that is what these knobs send. Let's see this, this knob uh, on the bottom left here. Right? So it's controller number 26. And as you turn the knob, it goes from 0 to 127. Okay. So that's what we're going to use. <coughs> So we give it a give it a name. We give it a function. Uh, we declare some arguments. So this again, just kind of print those numbers. And you'll notice that this MIDI def responds to all control change messages. Right? Everything, everything that sends a control change, it's going to send that data. And in the case of note on, that's what we want. We want it to respond to all possible note numbers so that we can actually play the keyboard like an instrument. But in this case, we just want it to listen to one knob or one fader. Because if we don't, then every controller will be updating this bus. And that's, that's just, you know, we want to we give them discrete tasks. So there's a third argument that you can include in a MIDI def, and that is what well, it's going to, its name is going to depend on the type of MIDI def. In this case, it's CC. But essentially, this is like a built in filter. It will only respond to MIDI data 
with a controller number that matches what you provide here. So it was uh, 26. So we'll say 26. And we can do a verbose argument style if we want, doesn't matter. So now, if we run this, uh, it's still listening to this knob, but clear the post window and touch all the other things, it, it doesn't, it's not listening. Right? So now we've basically isolated this MIDI depth so that it only listens to this one knob, that's what we want. Uh, oh, you can also uh, make this an array and give it a couple of different values, and as long as it matches one of the items in the array, it'll perform its function. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to say cfbus.value. Uh, we're going to set this to val um, divided by 127. Just, just scale this down to a, a sort of vanilla 0 to 1 thing that just zero to one is always nice it's always easy to work with mathematically so uh, it just sort of makes sense to me even though it's going to eventually become cutoff frequency values we'll scale it down here and scale it back up later and now what i'd like to do is open the scope look at the control buses and see if this works yeah okay cool so we turn the knob and we are just writing data to this bus we'll Scale this down just a little bit. So that's one, and that's zero. Mm, 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 mm. And so now we essentially have a, a dynamic control signal on the server when we can just have anything basically read from it. So we'll take this, paste it down yonder. And what we want to do here is I'll make a new variable. And we're going to read from a control bus. Yeah, and I, I could hardwire this in here, it, it would work. I just generally try to discourage this because um, it's inflexible. You know, if you, if you know for sure that you're only ever going to be using this bus, then sure, bake it right into the synth def and it's cemented in there. Uh, yeah, it, it never really hurts to make an argument. Um, you know, control rate, initialization rate, doesn't really matter. And then we'll put the, the default that we want in here. It's one channel. And we'll scale it, right? So we're gonna scale the cutoff frequency. We know this is between zero and one. Uh, so we can say uh, lin exp, right? This, this is a, a, a linear range here. So if I move this in a linear fashion, the number changes on linear fashion. So, but we're mapping it onto frequencies. So I think lin exp makes sense here. Zero for one, we'll say, um, we could do the full range. Yeah, it seems a little extreme. Wouldn't wouldn't be bad, but something like this maybe. Uh, and then we just want to say CF. Okay. And the default behavior of Linux is not that our bus value is going to go outside of zero or one, but the default behavior is to clip the value within the target range. So we're we're in a safe place here. We're not going to feed the filter some some bogus thing. It's not going to it's not going to like it. I think we'll be okay. Uh, okay, so now let's, uh, are we still making sound here? Yeah, all right, so let's see if this works. Yeah, we've got. So. Yeah, kind of awkward here with this camera blocking my access, but um, it works. And what's nice about this compared to the language side variable approach, like if we, the, the difference would be instead of doing this, we would say CF equals, you know, whatever, it's just, just some language side variable, um, val over 127 or map it however. When we do this, we would have to um, change our note on synth def so that when the synth is created, uh, actually this one here, we would also have to say and by the way, the setting frequency is CF dot lin lin, whatever. So we'd have to, this would make it so that when synths are created, they have the proper value. Uh, and then we'd also need to, you know, make this, make this one set existing synth. It would be messy. This is really nice because it just, there's this one, it just writes to this bus and that's the source of all the information for the synths. Yeah. And so I, I think this is a superior approach and I really honestly should have been doing it a long time ago. Yeah, so. Because it, it's even, it's dynamic. If I play a, let me extend the, um, 
release time. Uh, or I didn't have to do that. I could just um, go up here and say the release is going to be three. Yeah. So. So it's it's just it just works intuitively, very easy. And from here, you could do things like make uh, other arguments in your synthdef and other control values to control different parameters. Um, let me just show you one example of uh, using. Uh, let me see if I can adjust this. I want to be able to look at the uh, mod wheel down here. And so this this is the mod wheel. It, it's the one that doesn't snap back to center. Uh, uh, so we, we, right now everything is active, and if we wanted to uh, just disable that for a second, we could say MIDI def, uh, what's the name of it, note, disable. So it just turns it off, we can enable it, and it works again. This is maybe useful if you want to switch back and forth between two MIDI defs, you can disable one, enable the other, instead of having to like, I don't know, do something more complicated. But we can, let's, let's use the mod wheel to do this automatically. We can like flip this up, it's enabled, flip this down, it's disabled, just to give you a, a sort of generic example of the fact that MIDI can do whatever you want. It doesn't have to make sound or whatever. Uh, so we will say um, MIDI def CC. I mean, if you, if you wanted to, I mean, I happen to know that the mod wheel sends controller number one, but you can do this and just move it around. Right, so that's controller number one, zero at the bottom, 127 at the top. So we would say uh, mod wheel or whatever. Uh, and we're gonna say uh, some conditional logic here after we declare our variables. We don't even need the number because we're just gonna put that here. Right, just only listen to the mod wheel. Uh, so we'll say if val equals 127, uh, then midi def dot note, uh, sorry, not dot note, symbol note dot enable. And if it is zero, disable it. Just some, you know, simple conditional logic. We don't want to do anything if it's like 126 or 94. We only care about the extremes. Uh, and let's also say uh, enabled.postln, just so we can actually see that it's working. Okay, so enabled, disabled, enabled, disabled, enabled. And then we'll just turn it off, and now it doesn't do anything. Everything's still working, right? It's, it's just not listening to MIDI, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? <laughs> Very fun. And that's, that's a, hopefully that's a nice starting place if you want to do any MIDI-related things for your final project or stuff like that. Let's move on to the samples. We still have these samples loaded in here. So I'm going to start fresh and just wipe away all the MIDI defs. This is, you've seen s.freeall perhaps, or just getting all the stuff off the server. So free all works for MIDI def too. It just says any MIDI defs out there, they're gone. So now we don't see enable disable anymore. No sound, the bus is not being updated. It's all, it's all gone. But I think we still have these. Uh, just uh, let's say synth. Samp buff b dot kick amp point five. Yeah, good. Now what I want to do is map these samples to some keys. And I have nine samples. Uh, maybe I won't do all of them. You'll get the idea once we get started. Uh, so since I want to be able to play notes and here samples, we're going to use a MIDI def dot note on. That's the kind of uh, data that we're working with here. Okay. 
and we declare our arguments. And I'm, uh, okay, so we, we could do something like this, just like we did before. And each one of them plays the kick, but we want to somehow use the note number to pick the sample, right? We want to say like, okay, if I play this B down here, play the kick, and this E, play the snare. Let's see what those numbers are, first of all. So, let's see, I'm gonna go down to one octave, 35 and 40, okay, 35, 40. How do we do that? How, you know, what, what needs to go in here to convert numbers to specific samples? Any ideas? If it's a certain note. If, conditional logic, yeah. Right, it's just, it's like, you just gotta sort of train yourself to think if, like, okay, if the note number is 35, then, you know, Say we might as well make a variable for the buffer, right? Uh, it doesn't. Ha we can call it buff if we want to. Just giving it a slightly different name from the argument. Uh, so buffer, and we can say uh, if um, num equals thirty-five, then buffer equals b dot kick, right? And if number equals forty snare and then this is just going to be buffer yeah so this we can improve on this but this is a start right so now uh, so that works but these are all something else <laughs> because it uh, buffer is nil and neither of these conditional checks are gonna you know uh, set do anything so we're just providing nil here and and that I guess defaults to whatever the buffer with index, you know, it's, something is turning that into a zero somewhere, because I think that is the, the default, yeah, the first one. Oh. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow the general MIDI thing. So like this is the hi-hat and this is the open hi-hat or whatever. So there, let me introduce, uh, this is in chapter one in the book, but I'll, I'll just revisit it here. If you, if you have a lot of possible conditions, it's, it's messy to do if. I mean, it's, it's time consuming to do if, and you definitely don't want to start doing nested ifs. You know, like if, if otherwise, then do another if, and ooh, no, it's, that's not good. I mean, it's, it works, but it's just messy. So um, there is a, a conditional, a control structure called switch. There's two actually, there's one called case and one called switch. They're really pretty similar. But switch, um, you give it um, a, an input value and it's gonna be the note number. And switch is going to check for equality with various, you know, it's, it's gonna, and, and each one of these checks, the other side of the, you know, e equality check is gonna be some, uh, some value. And uh, so like something like this, And, uh, and basically the, the switch takes its input, checks for equality with various starting functions, and for the first one that matches, it's going to return the value of the corresponding function. And so we wanna capture that return value in our buffer. Uh, and then uh, if, uh, it, I think it makes sense to add something at the very end which is always true. Can you think of anything which is always true? That it is a note on. Uh, yes, that's true, but I don't think we can actually access the fact that it's a note on. I was just thinking like one equals one or something. You know, this is always true. Or you can just say true. True is always true. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll say um, just nil. I think, I think we'll get nil anyway, but then here we can say if uh, buffer dot not nil, right? I was saying only if buffer has been given a value, then play the sample. Yeah. So uh, now if we do this, uh, something happened. Is that still? Because you're giving it buffer nil at the end of the 
Yes, that is why. <laughs> Thank you. Buffer, not nil, yeah. And these don't do anything. Because here, uh, we could even uh, post buffer, you know? So like, uh, buffer dot buff num. All right, those are the indices, and this one is, it's a, you know, nil. Not working, because nil doesn't have a buff num. Anyway, so we can add a few more. We can say uh, 42 is going to be our closed hi-hat. 46 is going to be our open hi-hat. And uh, 41 and 43, Tom 2, Tom 1. I know, isn't it charming? It's great. <laughs> yeah, so whatever, any pack of samples you have, you can map them this way. Uh, the, you know, just the fact that I stored the buffers in uh, uh, an event means they're addressable by name, which means we kind of have to do something manual here with numbers to names, you know, there's, but if you store them in an array and you just want to use a contiguous block of samples, you can, you can do that. Uh, well, we have time, so, um, well, I'll, I guess I'll open it up. Is, is there any, like, if, is there like a sort of knee-jerk reaction that you would want to do to this code from this point, uh, you know, that we can do as a group? Yeah. Okay, so you want to use a knob. Well, it, so you know, to read forwards or backwards, we could use a knob, but a knob has like 128 values, and okay. really we just need two values. We, we just need two or, or yeah. which of it we need like on or off. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, could, we can use the knob and just say if it's greater than 64 or less okay. than 64 or equal to 64 or something like that. So we can use a button on the controller to activate backwards or... Um, I, we could use a button, but these buttons, um, well, you know, like we'd have to like hold it down or something. Uh, because uh, um, you know, like these 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 transport buttons here, they're 127, and then they're zero when I let go. Just turn this up a little bit. I mean, there's different ways to do it. Let's let's use a, let's use a knob. Let's use another knob. Um, and we want to uh, so play play the sample backwards if it's high and forwards if it's low. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll we'll give that a try. Um, let's see, uh, so the direction, and this is number 20, it's this, this knob right here, I'm trying to remember the upper left knob here, uh, so that'll be 22, right, and so let's make another, make another bus, why not? Uh, okay, and we are going to say if uh, val is greater than or equal to 64, then say uh, dear bus uh, dot value is 1. Otherwise, minus. right, minus one. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one. Uh, we do have to do a little bit more magic with uh, our synth def. So we'll copy the synth def, bring it down here, make a new version. And we just say times rate. And here the, here the issue is uh, um, if, if it's forward, no problem. We start at sample zero, we get to the end, we've done action two, and we're good. 
if we start, if, if playback rate is negative one, it's going to start at zero, go backwards, hit the end, and free itself immediately. So uh, we also need a start position argument. Uh, so trigger, we don't need, we'll just put a one there. Start position, we will space this out a little bit. All right, um, so now we can say, uh, uh, open hi-hat, and if we say start position is b oh dot num frames minus one, and rate is negative one, uh, num frames, <laughs> can't spell. <laughs> And uh, oh, I think we need to do, yeah, ah. we need to, because th this is actually the last frame, the one with, because um, frames start at count zero. So if you have 20 frames, the last one has index 19. So we actually have to go one further back. So all right, let's, let's keep this up here. And then we'll go ahead and uh, this is still working, right? Good. Uh, oh, I knew we need to make, um, th this should be. This should be, uh, I don't know why I made a, we, we want to actually do. If we do it this way, when we play it forwards, isn't it going to immediately hit the? Um... No, we're, we're going to specify both of these things oh. depending on the, uh, on the, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is a little bit trickier than, maybe this is just trickier using a bus, I don't know. But uh, um, in dot kr, I'm going to read. Right, so that's that, and we also want start position, and well, you gave me a tricky one. This is all right. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, yeah, and then uh, let's, where's our note on? Let's grab this. And just copy this, I guess. Just and this one's not going to do anything different. But all right, so we're picking the buffer, and then here, mm. okay. So the rate is the rate is good. We just need this this thing to be. Uh, determined. All right, so we'll do, I'll, this is the quickest thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, so select takes uh, an argument, and this is going to be basically an index, and then it's going to pick from an array. Um, so I'm not 100% sure this is going to work, but uh, so we either want, if the index is, um, so zero, We'll say uh, that, or if it's one, we'll say zero. So this is the frame we want if we're going backwards. This is the frame we want if we're going forwards. And this is going to be uh, is rate. Uh, is this what we want? Should we just map rate using like a one run? I think so, yeah, but um, let's see. Yeah, so we want to go from this to this. All right, and now we got to fix all our messy errors here. Semicolon, okay. Uh, let's, let's do something here. I want to say uh, rate response.poll. And then we'll make a synth here. Okay, so that is the playback rate, and that's the start position. So that looks good. Now, if we do this, and then do it, that looks good too. So now our oh, and it works too. It, it played it. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, so and this is all. 
Oh, I didn't mean to get rid of that because I'm going to copy this. Oh, we don't even need this stuff anymore. That's just, that's just, uh, and then, right. Maybe we can even change it mid, mid go. <laughs> okay. So then, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not the greatest interface, because if we want to play one of them backwards and one of them forwards, that's awkward. <laughs> but it does work. Right? Uh, I keep turning the wrong knob here. And this pole is, is cluttering up things, so we don't really need that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, no problem. Um, many other things you can do. You could add add effects, route them down the down the node tree. You know, echoes, reverbs, whatever, and then control those effects with more knobs. So, yeah, yeah. This is. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fun. That that makes a makes a very a very acceptable final project if you want some some sort of live performance MIDI based thing. So. Anyway, that's MIDI in a nutshell. There's not much more to it than that. You know, you just you connect your devices, right? Debug if you want. Uh, define various MIDI defs and write the functions to do what you want them to do. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. So. Okay. I hope this was useful and interesting. Uh, I am leaning towards talking about live coding in the next two classes, one or two classes. What I have done in the past is graphical user interfaces and OSC. Um, OSC is another control protocol like MIDI. It's a little bit different. Uh, and, um, and then you know, graphical user interfaces, that's, it's a lot to digest, I think, all at once, because this is a code-based language, and suddenly we're talking about you know, graphical widgets and knobs and faders and getting all of those data to talk to your synthesis code. I, um, Again, I have other videos, which you can, if you're interested in that sort of thing, but I'm, I'm trying to do more live coding, get better at it, and it's pretty fun. So uh, it, it gets me out of my comfort zone. So I think, I think that's what we'll talk about next week, uh, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, well, that's it for this week. Um, uh, your, your homework is due, uh, what, uh, the, the, the signal processing one, that's due a week from today. All right, that's it. Uh, yep, see you later.